So <clears throat> here are a few remarks that connect uh, episodes one and two of All Washed Over by Machines of Loving Grace to the themes of information and cybernetics as broached by Weaver and Wiener in particular. Now, quick recap. Um, All Washed Over by Machines of Loving Grace is a BBC documentary. It's produced by Adam Curtis. <clears throat> Episode one looked in particular at uh, Ayn Rand, uh, who, although she's discussed in terms of uh, being an icon of so-called objectivism, she's you know more generally understood as being uh, a leading figure in uh, the justification of free markets, so-called neoliberalization the global tearing down of uh, regulations and the, you could call it the welfare state, public services, with the notion that somehow <clears throat> when you eliminate state intervention, when you eliminate borders, individuals are freer to communicate and to realize their fuller potential. And Rand's analysis is loosely linked to the attempt in the 90s to impose free markets on Southeast Asia, leading to the subsequent collapse of those markets. So that's one thread of ideas. Another thread of ideas here is Silicon Valley. The startup culture of Silicon Valley, its celebration of Ayn Rand's ideas, and in particular, this idea that uh, the free heroic individual celebrated by Ayn Rand <laughs> would be realized through networked digital communications. Okay, if Ayn Rand wants the individual free and unencumbered to realize great projects, Silicon Valley develops this peculiar idea that actually these elaborate technological systems, a system actually of technical encumbrance, of technical layering, will actually produce conditions of free, natural exchange, communication, interaction. And of course, the presentation makes clear that there's a profound kind of uh, free market capitalist ethos ideology driving these, and in the case of Southeast Asia, specific political interests aligned with, uh, you know, wealthy, wealthy financiers, particularly in the United States, but also in Europe. <laughs> that are backing these ideas up. Now, I should note, Curtis doesn't fully integrate these strands. He's constantly jumping around telling multiple stories and using beautiful imagery to kind of blend them together. But what makes these ideas important for a history of digital media, a history of cybernetics, a history of information, is that Curtis argues persuasively, I think, that actually it's notions of cybernetics and information that are underpinning, that are the backdrop to the way both Rand's ideas are realized as a notion of free global markets, as systems of communication, systems of exchange and flow, and Silicon Valley's notion that the internet is a vast, large cybernetic system. So the argument here, the idea here, is that these very simple elementary ideas from the 1940s about how it is that you can measure and transmit communication, how it is that humans and machines uh, ex exchange communication between one another, and that there's a scientific and technical measure for this, that these ideas become the basis of much larger industrial and economic thought policy that are distinctly political in tone, that are distinctly uh, social in their implications. And to some extent, because cybernetics, information, communication, digital media are taken as simply being progressive technical advances, it's presented as if a notion of economics, that's a notion of global communication systems, a notion of Silicon Valley as simply putting people into communication as if this is neutral and natural. 
This is, in, in short, a method by which political ideologies with particular commercial interests become naturalized through appeals to digital communication, digital technology, digital ideas. This is unpacked in greater detail in episode two, where you see the rise of the idea of ecosystems, the idea, the modern idea of ecology as being a natural system of relations that exist in nature, where nature is constantly self-stabilizing in the same manner that Norbert Wiener shows cybernetic systems to be based on feedback mechanisms in humans and machines where uh, the circulation of information and its feedback to its source allows a constant adjustment to produce a kind of dynamic stability. Okay. Again, uh, Curtis is arguing persuasively, I think, that the modern rise of ecological ideas, particularly in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, is made possible and is rendered plausible by the availability of computing machines. That, in fact, nature has come to under, be understood as more or less like a computer that's involved in information and feedback mechanisms such as those described by Weaver and Wiener. And Curtis shows that this idea of the ecosystem, this idea of the cybernetic system as a natural set of self-stabilizing flows was also central to other projects of the period. For example, Jay Forrester's famous construction of a massive uh, Cold War American military defense system. It was a radar network that created a vast system of communications among uh, U.S. defense installations and um, had, a you know, by, nece by necessity, because it was all technically engineered to so the pieces communicated with the aid of computers and other devices, uh, necessarily was founded on ideas of information and cybernetics. Jay Forrester, after the 1950s, goes on to become uh, something of a world theorist of things like economic growth, global planetary systems, the relationship between a global planetary system and ecology, particularly through his work for the Club of Rome and his contribution to the Limits on Growth publication. <clears throat> All of these are based on systems theory. All of these take ideas on the one hand of cybernetics and information, uh, and on the other hand, notions of ecology, nature as being a cybernetic system, and it maps them onto global economics, and it comes up with a set of prescriptions for how you manage the global economy as a cybernetic system. And it has with it particular types of prescriptions. On one hand, you want to limit growth, you want to maintain the system as it is, on the other hand, you want to, for example, dismantle national authorities, national leaders, so on and so forth. <clears throat> so that instead of having regional feudal powers, you have one free flowing system that is stable, that is neither growing nor shrinking in its uh, contours. Again, as we see in episode one, it turns out the theory itself, while it's flawed, uh, the, theory, the theory of ecosystems itself is deeply flawed. It turns out that nature is not a cybernetic system that's in constant balance, but on the contrary, nature itself is a little bit chaotic, that it's actually a tangle of multiple systems that are constantly adapting and changing and taking on new contours. So the basic theory of Forrester, the basic theory of ecosystem is incorrect. And yet that reason, the reason we didn't see it was incorrect was partially because there was this notion that computing and information systems are on one hand, a perfect model of nature, a perfect model of systems. And on the other hand, this idea that, well, perhaps, perhaps with enough information systems around the planet, particularly if they're communicating freely and openly, Perhaps then we can actually create those perfect systems. So again, we're doubling back here on episode one in the sense that uh, 
Rand's idea of global free markets, global communications, Silicon Valley's dreams of establishing these global free markets through the free exchange of communication via the internet, is developed in Forrester's idea of a global system that needs to be stabilized. It's also worth noting that it's not just that the ecosystem idea is flawed, but of course Forrester himself, he and his uh, colleagues are putting forth a theory that says preserve the existing uh, stability, preserve the existing order. That is essentially means that the people who have a lot of power now keep that same amount of power. The people that don't, don't have much power don't change their amount of power. And that existing social relations do not change. So there's a deeply conservative tendency to the way these ideas are taken up by Forrester uh, and the way they're used in politics. So what? So how does this relate to some of the other ideas of information in cybernetics? Well, the two episodes are case studies in how and why ideas from computing, information, digital media need to be subject to critique and debate, in part because, particularly since the mid-20th century, there has been a tendency to conceive of society, to conceive of culture in reference to the most recent new media technologies, and to take ideas from information, ideas from cybernetics, ideas from computing, and to use them to explain other fields of activities. Okay, so countercultures uh, on... Um, communes, as we saw in episode two, economic theories, political policies for global regulation. All of these ideas, as they're developed in the course of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, are indexed to ideas of information and cybernetics. They take the model of communication, the model of efficient transmission that is developed, for example, by Shannon and explained by Weaver, and they transpose it onto a theory of economics, and they say, we want communication, we want circulation, and it should happen on as unregulated and freely as possible. This is not exactly what Weaver and Shannon had in mind, keep in mind. But the plausibility of these ideas, the plausibility of these economic claims are related to the notion uh, that somehow Digital technology, digital communications is natural, is transcendent, is not subject to history or politics. The same is the case with cybernetics, and cybernetics kind of slightly too tidy idea of stability. The notion that systems simply produce stability and reproduce stability, and one should aim to preserve and secure this stability. And so what the what the films argue, I think quite compellingly, is that scientific and technical ideas have a tendency to become tools of ideological justification for specific economic and political orders. Here's something that was touched on both by uh, Wiener and Deleuze, which is also that every single society uh, has something like its idealized tool, a particular instrument or tool that encapsulates cultural, economic, and political relations. And to some extent, you can explain those cultural, economic, and political relations in reference to that instrument, in reference to that machine. And for that society, because that society is increasingly organized around those technologies, organized around those machines, that instrument or technology comes to appear natural and neutral, something like eternal. So, for example, for the 19th century, it might be something like the steam engine. Okay, the steam engine associated with the rise of railways, associated with new types of industrialization, offers a model that is used across the sciences and across politics to explain the way society works, explain the way nature works, explain production, how production works. In the case of the 20th century, in our own present epoch, it's the computer. 
or it might, you might also say it's something like the internet. Because these tools are so central to the way our society functions, they can become points of reference to say this is how society should function. Economics should function like a radar defense system for Forrester. Economics should function like the internet functions for Silicon Valley. And in fact, these will produce, so the argument goes, a particular type of natural ideal person, in this case, a heroic individual who through communications, through information systems and networks actually becomes freer and more individual. The documentaries try to show the circulation of these ideas, how they get naturalized, for example, in a particular type of economic theory, in a particular type of industry, Silicon Valley, in the countercultural movement of the 60s and 70s in the attempt to form communes, in the idea of nature as an ecosystem. None of these ideas are, you know, strictly speaking, a product of computers. However, these are all various political projects, ideological projects, that make their political and ideological dimensions less apparent by appealing to digital technology, by appealing to notions of information and cybernetics and systems and communication. And so All Wash Out for by Machines of Love and Grace effectively invites us to think critically about where these ideas come from, to think about how they're used and instrumentalized, and to start debating both the history of those ideas and how their application has actually played out. So for example, the films are very interested in things like market crashes and why it is that economies don't seem to necessarily function like an ideal self-stabilizing cybernetic system and why the attempt to implement that actually seems to make the rich richer and the poor poorer and so on. <clears throat> so these are basically some case studies for looking at how ideas touched on in, in uh, control theory, in cybernetics, in information, get developed in the course of the 20th century and become part of everyday scientific, political, and economic life.